Okay, I think we're going to get started now. So welcome everyone to the 2021 Transportation Alternatives Project Selection Workshop. Before we get started, um, first of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Sarah Gutchow. I work at the Puget Sound Regional Council as a Senior Transportation Planner. And for housekeeping items for this workshop, um, the workshop will be in listen only mode, so you will not be able to turn on your microphone or camera. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box using the chat function, and we will read them out to the presenters at the uh, Q&A portions. Um, we also want to remind you that the chat box is part of the public record and that the workshop is being recorded and that the recording will be posted on the PSRC website after the workshop. You can find any information from the workshop on the TAP website page uh, that is shown here on your screen. And for any additional questions we don't get to during the workshop, or if you'd like to contact us for any reason, you can contact me at saragutchow at psrc.org as shown on the screen. So with that, I will turn to the presentation. Um, and I also want to introduce the other presenters today. We will have uh, myself, Sarah Gutchow, and then we'll also have Kelly McGurdy, uh, Kim Pearson, and Mitch Cook at PSRC. And you'll hear from them a little bit later. So as I said, um, this is the workshop for the 2021 Transportation Alternatives Program. And what we will be doing today is providing a general overview of the program, including project and sponsor eligibility, um, some details on the funding available and funding requirements. We'll be going into some detail on the different project valuation criteria, which you can see on the resources page. And then we will talk about the project selection process and schedule. And then I will turn it over to Kim, who will review all the resources provided on the website, as well as going through the application so that you can see what it will look like when you actually get to that point. So generally speaking, the Transportation Alternatives Program is a program for community-based projects to enhance the transportation system. And this encompasses a very wide range of eligible activities, as you can see on your screen. Uh, we have, PSRC have grouped them into three categories, which are bicycle and pedestrian, historic resources, and environmental. And for each of these, uh, we have more information in the eligibility resource, which you can find on the PSRC website as well. But as a broad categories for uh, bicycle and pedestrian, we have improvements to bicycle, pedestrian, and shared use facilities. We have um, some safety and educational activities, but only if they fulfill the Safe Routes to Schools program uh, eligibility criteria. For historic resources, that generally includes preservation of historic transportation facilities, as well as archeological activities. And then for environmental that we have grouped under their um, vegetation and stormwater management, protection of wildlife, as well as construction of viewing area areas and regulation of outdoor advertising, as well as a few other uh, categories. But when you look at this, you can, that, this will determine <clears throat> which type of application you should fill out. There's three different category specific criteria sets. Um, so you can view this to determine what type of project you have. For eligibility requirements, uh, generally speaking, the ones that we just mentioned are the eligible activities, but it's also important to keep in mind what is ineligible. So general transit and roadway capacity projects are ineligible, as well as general maintenance op operations of a transportation facility and recreational facilities. And this is especially comes into play when you're, we're talking about trail projects. So the uh, Federal Highway Administration has their definitions for recreational facilities. Um, so those categories of projects for trails are ineligible. For eligible sponsors, this includes local governments, tribes, and transit agencies are all eligible. And for ineligible, that most includes state agencies like the State Department of Transportation, uh, metropolitan planning organizations, and uh, most nonprofit organizations, but not all. Um, and these uh, entities are also eligible if they partner with an eligible entity. And more information is also available in the resource document. Um, also, generally speaking, for eligibility, um, in order to be included, then projects seeking uh, the funding must be consistent with the region's long-range regional transportation plan, which is was most uh, recently updated in 2018. Um, they also must be consistent with uh, local uh, uh, long-range uh, long-range plans. So. Um, and then they also must fill um, any um, general federal and state requirements for the funding source. In this case, the Transportation Alternatives Program. And just to add here, um, 
the reason that all these uh, need to be eligible for with their local and the regional transportation plan is that all these processes uh, in terms of eligibility funnel into each other and they end with project selection at the bottom of the funnel so that um, project selection is um, the culmination of all the eligibility for these different local plans. For available funding, um, we are distributing $13.5 million, which includes 2022, 2023, and 2024 funds, with $4.5 million available each year, although for 2022, this is the earliest obligation date available. Um, so we ask the sponsors when they fill out their application to select their first and second preference for years. Um, and then this is very important to know, there's funding limits for the funding requests. So funding requests are limited to two applications per agency. And please note that as in the previous competition, this was not a requirement, it was three applications per agency. Um, and similar to the previous uh, competition, it's 2.5 million request limit per project. And then as with all PSRC uh, funding competitions, awards are limited to a single phase or preliminary engineering and one additional phase. Additional funding requirements. Um, for federal requirements, there's a 13.5% match requirement, and then all fund uh, project phases need to be fully funded and funds should be secured or reasonably expected. And then for PSRC's project tracking policies for federal highway funds, all funds need to be obligated by June 1st of the program year awarded. So that would be um, one of the program years um, from the previous slide, 2022, 2023, or 2024. So for the evaluation criteria, as I mentioned, we have category specific criteria. We also have criteria that impacts all projects. So the first one is support for centers and then project readiness. And then for category specific criteria, this is based on the type of project that your uh, project fills onto. And then we also have other considerations which are worth zero points. So the criteria for all projects is worth 40 points altogether. And then the category specific criteria, 60 points for a total score of 100 points. Um, so we will, I will go into some more detail on these uh, different criteria in the next few slides. Um, but first wanted to mention a few general tips for filling out the application. Um, so most importantly is that you should, um, for, for any part of the criteria you're filling out is be thorough, answer every question, address every criterion, including every bullet point and respond um, fully and don't cut and paste between sections. Just keep in mind that there's, uh, there are human beings who are reading this. So if there's repetition between sections, we will see that. Um, provide a clear scope of work for your project when you're filling out this section for a project description. Um, be very clear on how the funds will actually be used. And also uh, don't assume that the scoring team, even though we are from the region, that we will know the project or the project area. So assume we will not be familiar with the project or project area and that we will not be doing any additional outside research to learn more about the project. Um, and also in, when, in the spirit of being as clear as possible, provide maps, graphics, and photos, and this will help illustrate your project and its location. And to go with that, when you do submit app attachments, please make it clear where we can find the relevant information within the attachment if you are referencing it. So to start with the criteria for all projects, um, the first one is support for centers. So the policy focus um, for PSRC funds is support for centers. For the transportation alternatives program, this includes regional growth centers, manufacturing industrial centers, and locally identified centers. So when you're filling out your application, make sure you're citing specific centers. Generally speaking, it doesn't matter how many benefits your project provides. If it doesn't meet the established criteria, then it will not score well. And the established criteria is a policy focus on support for centers. Um, when you are talking about housing and employment development, it's important to provide things like housing employment data or how the project supports development near transit. Generally speaking, we have a focus on transit-oriented development, that, so that will help your project score well. Um, then we also want to look at supporting the plans and activities of centers, including current developments that are happening in the center, as well as long-range plans and studies. And then on the topic of project readiness and the financial plan, um, we are looking to see that the project will be ready to use PSRC funds by the requested date. So it is important to provide information on the schedule of the prerequisites for obligation and project milestones, as well as a full project budget and financial plan. For the category specific criteria for uh, bicycle and pedestrian projects, um, we are looking for information on for the, the bullet point of how the project extends the bicycle uh, pedestrian network 
Um, information on citing uh, specific connecting facilities is helpful, as well as showing how a project completes a gap. And generally speaking, projects that complete a segment are more competitive than ones that are starting to close a gap. Um, for talking about the, the need and reducing barriers, um, painting a clear project of what the project is and how it addresses a problem will be helpful, such as closing gaps in the network or improving safety and comfort, like reducing steep grades. Um, we also need to see a clear nexus between the data you're providing on the need for the project and the criteria. Um, and also data and documentation of community input to document the need for the project will be helpful, like prior investments in the area, and then also coordination with other agencies. For safety and security, the most competitive projects will also incorporate safety. So for this, you can include things like crash rates near the area and how the project will help with those or details on the quality of facilities that the project will help improve the safety and comfort of. For multimodal connections, um, as I mentioned, the most competitive projects will incorporate access to transit. We also need specific examples of the specific intermodal uh, connections, such as bus routes that the project will connect to. For user groups, um, for this, we are not just looking for demographic data for the area. We're looking for more specific information like for the, for the area and how the facilities will connect different user groups. So an example of that would be facilities that will help a community with a high number of low-income people of color access services like schools or grocery stores or hospitals. So if you're looking for information on how to fill out this section, the project selection resource map can help here. Um, for loss of opportunity, um, this for this we're talking about something like development pressure in the area due to plan growth, which would be something would count as a loss of opportunity. For historic resources projects, um, for there's some similar criteria to the bicycle and pedestrian one, but the the questions that are uh, unique to the historic resources projects are things like the history of facility of the facility and providing transportation. So some examples of um, previous projects that have applied under this category, we have historic bridges, historic railroads, or improving pedestrian facilities in a historic district. Um, we also need information about the current and planned use of facility and how it connects to the regional transportation system. So an example of a planned use would be a historic railroad providing rides to visitors. And um, for the historic uh, significance of the project, examples would be a designation as a local state or national landmark or being a contributing part of a historic district. To go with that, there's also um, how the project is part of a historic preservation plan, such as being included in a seismic uh, retrofit program and the long-term maintenance plan for the project, including the parties responsible for maintaining it and then also the timeline for maintenance. And then, Similar to the previous category for providing public access and access to specific user groups, um, we're looking for information on how the public will be able to use the property for transportation or visiting or viewing the property. For environmental projects, um, for this one specifically, we're looking for the need for the project and its relationship to the transportation system. So some examples of previous environmental projects that have applied we have removal of fish passage barriers, uh, water quality retrofits, flood control measures, and wildlife crossings. So any of the eligible activities under environmental, but those are just some examples of some previous applications we've had under this category. And then one of the criteria I just want to address because um, it's only in the environmental category is how the project goes above and beyond requirements. So an example here would be a project that ensures that the construction has minimal impacts to fish and wildlife. So lastly, we have other considerations. And just one note that, as you can see, this is worth zero points. This is not a scored element, but this is where you can put additional aspects of the project that might impact, uh, that might be relevant to the competitive process, such as the public review process and actions to involve stakeholders and any other relevant documentation. So we'll get to the Q&A in a moment. Just wanted to go over the general project selection process. So we kicked off the call for projects um, on October 15th. Um, and where we are now is that once the uh, applications are submitted, first uh, PSRC staff will be scoring the projects. Um, and then we will be submitting our scores to the TAP committee. And the TAP committee will be meeting in late January to recommend projects to receive funding to our boards. 
So first the projects will go to the Transportation Policy Board, and then the Transportation Policy Board will make the recommendation to PSRC's Executive Board for the final funding decisions. And any projects that are not selected will be placed on a contingency list if more funds become available. Um, once the Executive Board makes their final decisions, the awarded projects will be approved into the Transportation Improvement Programs, the Regional and State Transportation Improvement Pro Programs. And once they are approved into the TIF, then sponsors will be able to obligate funds and implement their projects using that funding. So the schedule for this, as you can see on your screen, the first important date we have coming up is that all project applications are due on December 3rd. Um, and then the TAP committee will be making the recommendations on January based on the scores uh, provided by PSRC staff. Um, and then those scores will be sent, or those recommendations will be sent to the Transportation Policy Board. The projects will be released for public comment in February. And then in March, um, the Transportation Policy Board and Executive Board will make the final recommendations for project funding. And once those are submitted, then in mid-April, the projects will be approved into the state tip and the funds will be available for obligation. So I will just go over this briefly as I will be turning it over to Kim in a moment to go over the resources. Um, but we have provided a number of resources to help you with filling out your application. So those are, are all available on the PSRC website at the address you can see on your screen. And that includes eligibility information, more detailed than what we just went over, um, and then the full project evaluation criteria, which has guidance for each of the sections, and of course the application. So there's a link on the application where you can go to start filling out your project application. And then to help you with your application, we've also provided some resources, including a checklist, um, and then guidance for some of the specific parts of the um, application, like um, equity and population served, and then the financial constraint guidance. We also have a project selection resource web map, which um, Kim will be demonstrating in a moment. So with that, I will turn it, see if we have any questions before I turn it over to Kim. Okay, I don't see any um, specific questions in the chat, although I think Monica got one, which was asking, Will support letters from benefited groups help to improve the score of the project? So Sarah, I don't believe that's part of the scored criteria, but rather might be under other considerations. Is that correct? Yes, that would that's correct. So that would be helpful for the additional uh, the additional considerations. However, that is un, an unscored part of the application. Okay. So does anybody have any um, questions? Please put your questions in the chat to um, everyone so that we can, um, so that all the, the PSRC staff can see them. Um, questions about the criteria or the process or the schedule. I'm not seeing anything come in yet, Sarah. So why don't we go ahead and go on to the next section, but I will keep monitoring and um, I will let you know if we get questions come in. Okay, thanks, Kelly. So I'll turn it over to Kim Pearson. Thanks, Sarah, I'll just pull up my screen. Okay, are you seeing this? Great. Okay, so this is the main a uh, web page for the TAP program or tra um, Transportation Alternatives program. And uh, there's a little summary here at the top about what the program is. And then this section um, has a link to different documents that I'll pull up. So here you can find the schedule, which Sarah just went over. Then uh, this document here, Summary of Eligibility, describes which projects are eligible as well as uh, non-eligible projects and eligible project sponsors. Then uh, we have the Project Evaluation Criteria document, which goes into further detail about the criteria, including the criteria for all projects, as, as well as the criteria for each project category. So similar to what Sarah just presented on. And then there are ex examples of uh, projects 
uh, scoring high, medium, and low in terms of what kinds of projects receive those scores. And then there's a link here to the application, which I'll get back to in a second. And then below that, we have additional resources and guidance, including a project checklist, which has information on different aspects of the application, including the Regional Transportation Plan Project ID, if you have that, the certification acceptance um, process or inclusion for that in your application, as well as plan consistency and other information, especially regarding project finances, schedule, and delivery. Then we have a document on uh, equity and population served. And so this provides information on the different uh, populations that the application asks about, including a link to the interactive web map, which I'll pull up in a moment, as well as other resources that can be useful to filling out your application, including information on the regional demographic profile, air quality focus communities, and PSRC's opportunity mapping. Then there is the link to the financial constraint guidance, which shows um, examples of what are considered secured funds and reasonably expected funds and different examples of documentation that you could provide in your application. Then I'll bring up the project selection resource map. So this is a map that you can use to identify regional growth centers. There are different layers you can turn on and off. Um, you could also turn on the air quality focus communities layer. And then the opportunity index, which shows areas of very low to very high opportunity. And that's in accordance with PSRC's opportunity mapping. And then there are different demographic layers that show uh, tracks that have um, different populations that higher than regional average. So there are layers for people of color, people with low incomes, people with disabilities, older adults, youth, and people with limited English proficiency. So that's a resource you can use as well. And then we have a section on eligibility Q&A, which are basically some commonly asked questions about project eligibility, and you can click on these uh, drop down menus and see answers to different questions like, is my agency eligible to compete for these funds? Okay, so that's an overview of the main web page. And if you click project application, it will pull up this screen. And you can use your tip web application username and password uh, that you may or may not already have. Or if you're logging in for the first time, you can create a new username using this new user function over here. So I have already logged in to a sample application. And the main things here are just to be as clear and concise as you can in this application. And also understand that there is some skip logic in this form in that if you answer certain ways to some questions that will influence whether some other questions show up. So for this first section, you select the type of project category that corresponds to your project. And so that will influence whether the criteria, category specific criteria questions show up or how those show up in later sections in the application. So I selected bicycle and pedestrian projects. And then uh, so questions related to bicycle and pedestrian projects will show up later. So the next major section is just general information about your project. You can put in the project title, the regional transportation plan ID if you have it or not applicable if you don't. And there's additional information there about how to find that. And then there are drop down menus for your sponsoring agency or co-sponsors if applicable. And then here, um, you say whether you have certification acceptance, and if not, 
uh, you can select which agency will agree to serve as your co-sponsor. So that's an example of some skip logic in this form. This next section is just about your project contact information. Make sure that's filled out as correctly, very correctly. And then this next section is your general project description. So you can provide information on your project scope and then your project justification, need, or purpose. Here you can provide your project location information, including the address, route, or trail name, the counties in which the project is located. And if it's if the project crosses multiple counties, you can select multiple counties. And then there is a section for landmarks. And if you have any map or graphics, project graphics that you would like to upload, and you can upload multiple files if necessary. Um, so this next section is on plan consistency. And you are asked whether the project's consistent in a local plan. And if yes, the question is there um, to provide information on where in the plans um, your project is, uh, or the type of project is consistent. And then if not, another question to answer about, um, you know, if whether your project consistent with other plans. This section is about federal functional classification, if that applies to your project. And so you can select the type of functional classification. And if it's not applicable, there's that option as well. So if I click urban, a pop-up will show there. This section is about support for centers, which is criteria for all projects. And um, from over before, the, there are questions about your relationship or project to centers. Um, and other questions about how your project supports um, centers and different activities. So because I chose bicycle and pedestrian projects before, the questions about bicycle and pedestrian projects will show up here. And as you could see, these are long text format questions. Then we get into the funding request section. Have you, has the project received funds previously? If yes, please provide the tip ID. If no, then you can move on. So this section asks about the actual funding request that you would like to make. So there's guidance here reminding you that um, funding requests are limited to two applications. You must have a 13.5% local match and that you can apply for one phase or preliminary engineering plus the subsequent, subsequent phase. So my example here uh, shows that. And so you can there click uh, drop down uh, menus for the phase, the year, and then you can put in the amount and this button here calculates the amount. Then we have the total estimated project cost and schedule. And so here you should put in the total costs for each phase and also include the fund sources for each phase. And um, you should also include, for example, the phases that you're requesting for funding, the uh, TAP funding source and the amount that you are uh, requesting. So for example, there's, um, you should select the type of fund, local, state, or federal, the fund source, using a drop down menu, um, the funding status, whether the funds are secured, reasonably expected or unsecured, and the fund amount. And again, the uh, calculate button here will add up the total fund amounts and then you should put your expected year of completion for each phase. And going back to the TAP funds, uh, you should put that the funds are unsecured in that phase because they have not been awarded yet. Um, and what we're looking forward to is that within the phases that you're requesting funding that all the fund sources are either secured or reasonably expected. 
Um, so it'll be very important to um, indicate that and provide documentation. So, and you should just to reiterate, put in information for all of the phases of your project. And um, at the bottom, there's a way to calculate total project cost and then put in your estimated project completion date, month and year. Kim, before we move on to the next page, I don't know if Mitch is gonna jump in and talk through this further, but there's a couple of questions um, in the chat that address this. And I thought it would be good to pause on the funding page and reiterate some of the key premises. So first, um, the basic federal requirement is 13 and a half percent match. And I know Kim walked through this, but I wanna stress, especially for those that might be new to the process, for every phase that you're requesting PSRC funds, the entire phase with all funding sources has to be demonstrated to be reasonably expected to be fully funded. So it's not just you're, you're gonna ask for $100,000 of TAP dollars and then put in 13 and a half percent match. If the total cost of that phase is $500,000, all of your, your available funding sources, including the request needs to, to add up to that amount. And that was where the, the reasonable expectation. And I think Kim, you had pointed them to the financial constraint guidance where there's more information on that. So that's one piece that's really important. That I just wanna stress. And then I also wanna stress um, making sure that you're, you're requesting funds for a particular phase, but as Kim just pointed out, providing us the full project budget in this section that she's walking through is really important. And then Kim, before I, I let you loose onto the next page, there was a, sp a particular question I wanna clarify um, related to the required obligation dates for these funds. In general, PSRC does require a June 1st obligation date for the year that's requested. However, we did talk about, um, and Sarah, we had talked about this as we built this project because the they are, these are 2022 through 2024 funds, but since we're doing the programming now and they won't be approved into the STIP until April, we're not gonna hold you to a June 1st, 2022 date. So you will be able to select June 1st, 2023 or June 1st, 2024. If you can go sooner, that is fantastic. And you are certainly welcome to do that, but we were um, we are allowing that additional flexibility because a, a two month turnover is, is a little bit fast. So I, there's lots more questions coming, but maybe we'll, um, Kim, finish yours and, and Mitch if he's popping in, and then we'll come back and go back through the rest of the questions. Thanks for letting me interrupt. Problem, that was um, good to answer those questions. Okay, so for this next question, Mitch will jump in to provide some, or this next, next section, Mitch will jump in to pro provide some additional information. Yeah, so for this section of the uh, application, this is where we're asking for financial documentation um, for the requested projects. Um, what we're looking for here is um, complete documentation of all funds that will be in the projects um, or the project that you're requesting. So what we're generally looking for is um, local CIPs or TIPs, um, award letter, grant award letters, or um, letters of commitment to funding from jurisdictions. Um, it's important to keep in mind that we, we as in PSRC cannot program any funds that are not secured. And therefore we need the documentation to demonstrate that the funds are secured that you're hoping to program. Um, and match what the awarded funds through our processes. Um, and you are able to upload multiple files uh, or documents for the uh, financial documentation um, and just be sure to include everything or documentation for all the funds. Um, I think it's the biggest concern here. This is probably the area that we have the most follow-ups required because um, applicants don't give us substantial documentation. So um, we're hoping to avoid that scenario. So yes, as mentioned, you can 
Uh, the first question is to enter description of the financial documentation. And in this question here, you can upload documents that support um, or that provide documentation of the reasonably expected or secured funds. So this part, uh, I'll turn back to Mitch as well, just to provide an overview of project readiness. Thank you. So Kim will kind of discuss the actual functionality of this part of the application, but just some tips of what we're looking for as we're um, reviewing these applications. Um, we need to, we're looking for uh, the project to be have a logical timeline. Um, one example is we wouldn't question if the PE right of way and construction phases are all expected to be completed in one year. That's highly unrealistic. Um, so we would definitely question that timeline. Um, and in general, we're looking to ensure that everything is consecutive and that the PE and right of way are completed before the construction um, processes begin and obviously finish. Um, that's uh, sometimes people are um, agencies have issues with the readiness section. So we just want to be clear that those are a few things we're looking for. Um, and then Kim can kind of go through the functionality of the actual application. Um, yeah. So this first section asks about kind of preliminary engineering and design. And so if you're requesting funds for only a planning study or preliminary engineering um, and you hit yes, then some of the other questions go away. But if not, then it asks you about the actual estimated start date, whether preliminary engineering or design is complete. And just another example of some uh, skip logic. If it is, then you put the date of completion and whether there are any other milestones associated, PE design milestones associated. If not, then whether you've submitted preliminary plans to WashDOT for approval, and then the expected um, plan uh, completion date, preliminary plan completion date with month and year. So then for the next section, um, it asks about environmental documentation. So you put the current or anticipated level of environmental documentation required under NEPA, whether NEPA documentation has it been approved, yes or no, and then the date of approval or the anticipated date of completion with month and year. Then for right-of-way, it asks whether right-of-way will be required for this project. If no, then the questions go away. If yes, then there are a series of questions related to right of way. And one other skip logic here I'll call out is the question on whether your agency has experience in conducting right of way acquisitions. If no, the questions change. So that's just um, some background on this section. And Kim, before um, before you go on to construction, just a reminder to folks, this is about the status of the whole project. So even if you're not requesting right-of-way funds, if you have a right-of-way phase, it's really important to fill out those questions. And also just reminding, you cannot apply for both right-of-way and construction in the same grant request. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so then, yes, fill out the project readiness for every phase, regardless of whether you're applying for funding for that phase or not. Um, so then, yes, if funds are being requested for construction, yes, um, do you have an engineer's estimate? You can attach the engineer's estimate, um, identify permits needed, and fill out these other questions about P, S, and E, plans, spe specifications, and estimates. So that's the end of the project readiness section. Then, as mentioned, there is a section on other considerations. And so you can provide additional information on your project. 
that may be relevant to the final project recommendation, as well as information on the public review process for the project, and then upload any relevant documents. And uh, this is the last page, so you can hit submit if you're all done. Um, you can save your progress. We definitely recommend saving progress frequently or working in a separate document throughout and then submitting when you're ready. Uh, so that is the overall application. I think we have some more questions in the chat, so I'll leave it to Kelly to identify. Okay, terrific. So some of these questions I, I can go ahead and field and for some of them I will farm out to all three of you. Um, the first question is, are there specific goals for um, the awarding of funds among the three different categories or across agencies? And there really isn't. Um, we will end up with a prioritized ranked list of project based on score and the score is equally um, a, a 60 point score under a bike ped project is the same as a 60 point score under an environmental project. So the committee will be presented with a ranked list of scores and there is no set uh, distribution goal of funds across across those categories. Um, we had another question about um, for those of you who have been involved in PSRC's funding processes, you are accurate. We are not doing an eligibility screening form process this time around. Instead, we have eligibility Q&A on the website. And Kim, I, don't, I apologize. I don't remember if you showed the eligibility Q&A. So that might be something we could, can we pop that up on screen really quickly? Yeah, so what we tried to do is identify some of the, the key um, features and questions that would have been covered under that eligibility screen and tried to provide, you know, whichever thorny issue might you might be interested in um, trying to shorten it up and provide here. So we, we really do encourage folks, though, we've tried to hit on the key pitfalls that we know about from our experience during these processes and the key pieces of information that are necessary. So we really, really encourage you to read through all of the materials in the call and then these these tips and tricks that we're putting up on the website. Um, Sarah, are ports eligible sponsors? Yes, ports are eligible sponsors. They're considered local governments, so they're eligible sponsors for the top competition. Okay. Uh, Kim, is there a, so there, I know that there is not a word version of the application, but within, um, and we've tried to use the checklist as the as the way that folks can understand and, and look up and uh, know what questions they should be researching for their application. But in the form site, can they print off a PDF of a blank application once they're in form site? Um, not sure if that's possible in okay. form site, but we could look into sending a PDF. Okay. If that works. I'm not sure it's necessary because again, all of this information is in the call for projects within the, particularly the, the checklist for the application. So I think we've gone over um, all of the pieces that, that folks would, would need for that. Um, Sarah, I'll send this one to you. The scoring criteria has, for support for centers there is no distinction identified for type of center. So does that mean that the regionally designated centers, the countywide centers, and the local centers are all considered equal and the same? I think that is true. Is that right, Kelly? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it, is, it is true. There's no, um, it's support for centers writ large, and it's whatever, however the project is supporting whichever of those centers um, that's relevant. And if it's a local center, the same criteria and the same point values would be, would apply um, whether it's local or regional. I'm gonna continue scrolling down. Um, there's a question on, and maybe maybe Mitch, I'll send this one to you around federal functional classification wasn't identified on the project checklist, but it is on the application. I'm assuming for these projects they're not even a, a bicycle facility on a roadway because of the non-motorized nature pretty much all of these particular eligible projects would be na for functional classification is that correct yeah i believe so i don't imagine any would have an id um just based on these projects that would be submitted 
Yeah, I think that's right. We, we never know because there are some environmental projects, but I believe all of the eligible project categories for this funding source should be um, considered not applicable under federal functional classification, but we'll, we can take that on a case by case basis and uh, just make sure things are eligible. Um, Sarah, I'll send this one to you, but I, I feel free to pump back to me if necessary. Um, for all of the criteria, there's a number of bullets and they are equally weighted, I presume. We've not, there's no priority that's been predetermined that one bullet is more than another. Yes, that is correct. So there is no weighting for any of the bullets under the criteria other than, so the only thing you'll see in the criteria that that's exactly how we determine the scores. So we have an overall point value. So we don't have any uh, sub weighting underneath that criteria that wouldn't already be shown in the criteria. And I can uh, show that again, if anyone's interested, but as a reminder, it was 40 points for the general uh, criteria that would apply to all projects and then 60 points for the category specific criteria. Okay, and then the last question that I'm seeing, um, and, and I think Kim, you walked through this on the application is how to identify on the application form that a phase was previously completed. And I believe I saw that, I think there's two places when you're <clears throat> in the budget, identifying the completion date, but then also in the project readiness, there's an opportunity to, to note where it's completed. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, for example, if PE is complete, you can put yes, and then the date of completion. Um, and then there are other uh, sections too. So for example, for NEPA, if that has been approved, yes. And then the date of approval um, can be put there. Okay. And I, I actually saw something as you were going through this and I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping the answer is no under the, there should no, shouldn't be a skip logic for um, if they're requesting construction funds, because they would we would still expect them to complete those questions even if they're not requesting funds for construction. Okay, uh, we will fix that. <laughs> that might need to be that might need to be fixed because again, the project readiness is about the completion of the entire project, regardless of which phase folks are requesting. Um, a new question popped up: um, Our DBE goals a requirement of this program. Sarah, do you wanna to touch on that or do you want me to address that? Uh, yeah, I'll, I think I'll punt that back to you. Okay. So um, for PSRC and the grant award, we have no specific requirements related to DBE goals and there's nothing specific to the eligibility of the funding source, but as you're, and I don't know if we have, um, one of our WASHDOT partners on the call, but um, once you get to the point of once you're awarded and then you're going through the federal requirements and state requirements for obligation of the grant awards, um, this is an area that I'm less familiar with. There are certain um, basic federal requirements related to certain things of this nature. I don't know if uh, DBE goals for construction of this type of facility um, is one of those, but that is a, it's an interesting question and we will, um, I'm making a note, Christopher, of your name, and we can look that up and get back to you. But um, I'm not a, I'm not aware of that, especially since these are federal and not state funds. But that's something we can look up and get back to you on. Are there any other questions related to process eligibility of a particular project? If you have questions on how a project might uh, score under the criteria. We've, I know the the team um, has tried to note some of the some of the the tricky bits that we've seen from prior competitions and and uh, encourage you to fill out certain things. One thing I noted as uh, Kim was going through the application, it's always helpful to include maps and graphics. I know that was kind of an optional upload at the beginning, but it's always helpful for the scoring team to really be able to see where the project is and see some of those connections. So we would encourage you to submit those. Sarah, anything else from, um, this is not your first time around the block on the TAP program, any other um, pointers or lessons learned from the last process that you can think of that we haven't teased out yet? Um, I was just gonna remind everyone that the TAP website page, um, it can be found in the chat, but we can post it again. Um, if you'd like to see it, you can also find it on our website. 
um, by looking under project selection. And then in terms of uh, previous competitions, I think just what we went over in terms of filling out each uh, criteria fully um, to the best of your ability, providing supporting documentation and data. And if you have any questions, you can also um, message us um, for questions about the application as you're filling it out, or if you have questions about the specific criteria, if you don't understand anything, um, we are happy to uh, chat with you and you can um, send an email to me, which is also listed on the TAP website page. Okay, maybe give just a few minutes. Um, there we go, there's another question. Um, if applying for right of way phase, is there a requirement to have construction funding reasonably secured to be eligible? That is a great question. Um, maybe, um, Mitch, I can start that, but then you can add, add some color commentary. So we want you to give your, if you're applying for the right of way phase for TAP funds, we wanna definitely see that you have um, a reasonable expectation of funding for the right of way phase, including the, the uh, grant request. For construction, you don't have to have those funds secure, but we do need to see the estimates so we can see the full picture of the, the project. Mitch, is there anything you would add to that answer? Uh, no, except that just in general, regardless of which phase you're applying for, we do wanna see the total project cost, even if it is unsecured in the future. Um, for example, if you're applying for PE or right-of-way funds and your construction phase is not secured, that's fine. We just need to see what the estimate estimated total cost is um, regardless. Yeah, really good point. Um, I'm seeing a question from Brennan, if we're going to be adhering strictly to the 4.0 million of all project awards per year, or do they need to balance out? So that's a great question. I, I'll field this one. So um, since these are 2022, 2023, and 2024 funds, um, the only deviation from the balancing by year is the fact that since we're programming 2022 a bit late, will allow 2022 to eke into 2023. And so having a little bit more time, um, but it'll it'll definitely be 4.5 million program for 2024, 4.5 million for 2023. And then for the 2022 dollars, if folks can go early, that's great. But if not, we're, we are gonna allow them to add on to 2023. So hopefully that, hopefully that answered the, the question. Um, in general, the answer is yes, but just because of the, the timing issue with 2022, there's going to be some overlap there. Okay, I'm trying to think if there's any, any other tidbits I can think of. Maybe just um, in the project description and the project justification, we'd like complete answers, but please don't write a book. Um, so try to be, uh, be concise and be impactful and, and get the right information out there. But, um, oh good, there's a, there's a 300 words or less. So that's always helpful. Um, is there a deadline to spend the funds in the program year? Um, Mitch, you might be a little closer to the action on this one as well. There's no PSRC requirement related to expenditure. There's a general... FHWA expectation about um, progress on the projects, but Mitch, do you want to take a stab at that? And then I can also chime in as, as needed. Um, are, I'm assuming they're referring to the awarded amount. Yeah, so after obligation and then spending the dollars. Oh, um, oh yeah, I'm not sure about what the dead, if there's a deadline after obligation. Okay. So yeah, so my understanding is, so it's certainly not a PSRC rule. There's a high level federal expectation of you have 10 years to complete a phase before the next phase has to be started. However, you don't really have 10 years because if there's not progress being shown um, on a particular project phase after obligation, you will be put on what's called the FHWA inactive list. So you have to you have to demonstrate continued progress, um, submitting submitting of bills for reimbursement, and after a certain time frame, and I want to say it's ninety days after obligation, um, 
if you don't have that continued progress, uh, the state will be calling you and you could be put on that inactive list. And then you basically would have to demonstrate is the project, is there, is there a good reason that you're not submitting regular bills on the project or um, is the project stalled? And then that's a conversation between uh, you, the state and FHWA. But no, um, no set um, particular deadline for overall, you do have that, that time frame to complete, but they do expect regular progress. Um, there's a question from Jim related to the historic category. So in Pioneer Square, historic area ways hold up modern roadways. Would a project be eligible in the historic category if it includes rehabilitating and strengthening area way walls and rebuilding the sidewalks on top of them? So Sarah, that might be something we need to go to the historic eligibility category unless you have a, a short answer to that. I guess uh, my short answer would just be that in previous competitions, we have had projects for improving sidewalks and things like curb ramps and historic districts. Um, but for the more specific question about area ways, I think we'd have to look into that to see um, what would qualify as a transportation facility in a historic district. Yeah, and, and Sarah, maybe we can um, elaborate on this just a little bit. Um, so we know there has to be, for any historic facility, historic asset, there has to be the transportation nexus, first and foremost. But then there's also, aren't there some requirements related to what's truly considered historic? Yes, yeah, so there are requirements for the historic aspect. So um, I think we'd uh, need some more information there on um, the district. Wow. And I can't remember off the top of my head, and thank you, Kim, for opening that, or Sarah, if you're the one opening it, um, whether or not they are actually designated at the on the um, a local or local state or national registry. That might be in the criteria itself, actually. There's some general information in the criteria, but I don't think it would go that much in detail in there. We have some criteria for what could be helpful for um, what would a project that would score higher, but in terms of eligibility, I think we need to look into it. So here we go. I'm actually saying under, um, Kim, if you're the one running that, could you make that screen a little bigger? The second bullet under there about the historic significance, um, it doesn't sound like this is necessarily an eligibility screen, but these would, the, would be the type of projects that score higher than others if the facility is actually um, designated as a landmark or as a contributing part of a historic district. So yeah, these are, those are somewhat unique types of projects that um, you're describing. So probably giving Sarah a follow-up call and talking through that would be helpful. Yeah, that would be helpful to have some more information there. So um, yeah, I'm, we're happy to look into anything um, where we have questions. Okay. Other questions related to criteria, eligibility, what color Mitch's walls are. Okay, I'm not seeing anything come through. Um, again, we would really encourage everyone, please do read all of the materials. There's some really helpful information in there. Um, we believe there's everything you need to know to score well is in the in the call for projects. So please do read it. And then the team is available for uh, questions, certainly. And I'll just maybe I'll touch on that briefly. We won't um, we can't tell you how to write your application, but to the extent that we can tell you what we're looking for and uh, eligibility, we will certainly we will certainly do that and feel free to to send. Um, exploratory questions into Sarah and her team. Yeah, so just to reiterate, as somebody asked before, we do not have a screening form for this, um, but we do have an eligibility Q&A and information. And there's, of course, additional information and eligibility on um, the FHW website for any other questions that aren't answered by those resources. So we don't want anyone filling out an application if your project isn't eligible. I'm sure you don't want to either. So if you have any questions where you think a project may or might not be eligible, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, the applications are not due till December 3rd, so we have some time. Okay, well, Sarah, I'm not seeing any more questions come in, so I'll just turn it back over to you if you wanna do a wrap up. Sure. So. Um, just, uh, just to reiterate, this is an interesting program. There's a lot of different types of activities that 
these funds can be used for. There's um, some detailed information on eligibility, but even within there, there's a lot of different types of projects where you can use the funds. So we are excited to get started and see what you all come up with. And um, we have a deadline of December 3rd. So that's our first deadline coming up. Um, you are, are of course welcome to submit your application earlier. And of course, to reach out to us if you have any questions. And I think that's it. Do you have anything else, Kelly or Kim or Mitch? I don't. Great job, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And I'm still not seeing any further questions in the chat, Sarah. So you can give everybody their Halloween weekend. <laughs> All right. Happy Halloween. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.